Good morning. Today's scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. Verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 6 And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of the Lord. I now invite Pastor Chris Manivanan for today's sermon. Thank you, uh, Marisa. Thank you, uh, Pastor Robert, Dorothy, for uh, inviting me to share the word this morning. Thank you all, uh, church. Uh, very good morning to all of you. I bring greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord keep you safe and uh, healthy, uh, even as today's uh, sharing. It is about the word of God. We're trying to speak into our hearts so that our lives can be changed and transformed. So uh, let me just share the screen with you this morning as we look to God for his word. Let's pray before we go. into the word this morning. Come, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you this morning, Lord. This is the first day of the week. This is the day of the Lord. We thank you for bringing us together. Although we are physically distant, but we are one in the spirit and in your body of Christ as the head. And so, Father, we thank you this morning. May you open our hearts. May you bring conviction to our spirit man. Help us, Lord, to see you in your very word. So this morning, I want you to take your rightful place in our various homes, in our various hearts. Bring us to transformation. Bring us to repentance. Bring us, Lord, to the very place that you want us to be because you have a purpose for us as a church in this time and season of our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Friends, as we look to God's word this morning, we know that God's word is active. He's going to speak into our hearts and life. It is Easter morning. 21st April 2019. At Easter, we all know that darkness does not have the last word. And that's why people were going to church all over the world in the first place. To listen again, the message of hope. Christ is risen. He is indeed risen. And at around, at around the same time where all the churches in the world celebrating the Lord's resurrection. 
bombs were going off in churches in Sri Lanka. Over in Sri Lanka, bones were being blown away and flesh stripped apart from skin. These people woke up this morning full of hope, excited in anticipation of the story of Jesus' resurrection. They put on their best clothes and polished their shoes. Now their blood is being mocked from the sanctuary floor. More than 290 people died and more than 500 people were injured. This is a record for us taken from Washington Post. Question posed, same question posed 2,000 years ago. Do you think that these worshippers were worse sinners than all the worshippers in Sri Lanka because they suffered in this way? Answer from Jesus. I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. So friends, the question of repentance has been a question not only 2,000 years ago, but a question that has been asked throughout every generation. And so, as this morning, we look into the Word of God. What is the Word of God has to say? There are many opinions about repentance. But I like to say about this, two views on repentance. There's this poet, Lord Byron. He lived sometime in the 18th century. He's a British poet. Now, his view is the weak alone rep repents. I suppose this is the view of our generation these days. If you go to the marketplace, if you go to the outside world, people will say that it is the weak that re repents. The strong will never repent. It is very true because if you look at, at, at the way that the world structure is being implemented, is being done, it is the strong that always rules. It is the strong that always eat up the weak. So the weaklings are the one that has to repent and go down on their knees and ask for mercy. But this is the view of the poet Lord Byron. But I want to share with you another view. Well, I repent and stand suddenly while I'm in some liking. I shall be out of heart shortly and then I shall have no strength to repent. This is William Shakespeare, who lived about 100 years before poet uh, Byron, Lord Byron lived. And William Shakespeare has this, in his character, he says this, the strength, repentance is a sign of strength. Now, who is right? Is a repentance a sign of weakness or repentance a sign of strength? Is Lord Byron or William Shakespeare? Because the concept of repentance is so difficult to, to accept in this world. People will look at repentance as some kind of an ancient way, some kind of, of a way that you need to bow down and ask for mercy. It's easy to talk about the love of God. It's easy to talk about the grace of God, but it's so difficult to talk about the repentance where people need to repent. And yet we know that William Shakespeare's view could probably be some sort of a view that Jesus is speaking. For Jesus, repentance is the key to everything. Repentance is the way in which we should process everything that comes to us. In fact, repentance is a greed, is a greed through which everything should pass. Because repentance is a need for every one of us. Now, for Jesus, repentance is a key to everything. Repentance is the way. Now, how do Jesus views repentance? Now, I want to suggest that Jesus has three questions. So this morning, I would like to suggest that there are three questions that Jesus wants to ask. Firstly, why? Why do you need to repent? The need for repentance. Second, 
the nature of repentance. What is that repentance all about? And thirdly, how? So the why question, the what question, the how question, these are our questions that not only you and I will ask, but our children will ask. The generation of the, this generation, the 21st century generation, the postmodernism will, people will ask why, what, and how. So as we look at these three questions, firstly, question number one, the need for repentance. It is a universal need because as Jesus was talking to a crowd and teaching them and the crowd were just asking them that some news about Galilean who the Roman governor Pilate had murdered in Jerusalem. So the blood of these people, the innocent people have mingled with the people there. So they were asking questions. And so they were also asking why the tower that fell in Siloam and why do you think that it only killed the 18 people? What about the balance of the people? Were the people who were killed were most worse sinners than the people who were not killed? Now, this is a question that has been posed to Jesus. But this has been a question has been posed right from the start. The, when mankind, when humankind fallen, when Adam and Eve fall from the grace of God, when Adam and Eve fall from sin, to sin. And this is a question. Uh, you, but repentance is a universal need. Since this is true, what does Jesus' audience at that time, what do they want to hear? Did Jesus tell them to save money for the future or have fun now while they can? Do something to make uh, people remember them later? No. He tells them to repent. Jesus so shows us that the universal need that Jesus shows us that repentance is the universal need. When bad things happen to you, it does not mean that you are worse offender than the others. In fact, Jesus is saying, we all deserve to have towers fall on us. It is merely the grace of God that towers don't fall on us. Uh, I know we, we can talk about towers falling on us. Uh, maybe in Kuala Lumpur, there are a lot of towers. Love, but if you go to a places that there are no towers, then, uh, then it's easier to share. But we all know that what is Jesus is saying that we all deserve to have towers fall on us. It is merely the grace of God that towers don't fall on us. So when bad things or good things, they all must lead to repentance. According to Paul, in Romans chapter 4, verse B, part, second part of Romans chapter 4, verse, second part of Romans chapter 4, he says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? So what is, what is Paul is saying? Paul is saying that, Good things and bad things, they all must lead to repentance. If bad things come, they always come. Bad things always come. And when bad things come, it must lead to repentance. But when good things will come, we all have to also, it also must to lead to repentance. And that to show that God's kindness, we shouldn't rob away God's glory and God's kindness in our life. Let me prove to you why does Jesus say all these things? Because in the Bible that we all know that all of life is repentance. You see, Jesus begins his career by saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So for Jesus, his, when he started his career, he started his career with this a pita, with this uh, mission that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So for Jesus, all of life is repentance. And not only that Jesus believed in repentance, Jesus started his career in repentance, but he also equipped his disciples and sent them out to proclaim the gospel. Mark chapter 6, verse 12 says, so they went out and proclaimed that 
people should repent. And not only that, the first ever sermon preached after Jesus' ascension was the sermon preached by Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse, verses 37 and 38. What does it say? Where, what shall we do, Peter? When Peter preached the sermon out of his heart, he preached the sermon and they all asked Peter, what shall we do, Peter? Now, when they heard this, that they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles in verse 37, brothers, what shall we do? And verse 38, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So friends, Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38. This is the first sermon ever preached after Jesus' ascension. What was the first sermon preached? First sermon preached to the people was to repent, repent, and turn to God. So there's a need to repent. Why? Sin. And there is a radical self-centeredness in our life. We all know that we need to repent because for Jesus have already showed us, Jesus has made these assumptions to all of us that we are all sinners. We are all sinners and pointing to the doctrine of sin. That's why we need repentance. But sin is, the heart of it is a radical self-centeredness. And what I mean by radical self-centeredness, that this is a connection between two realities. First reality is you can repent unless you realize you deserve the tower fall on you. Okay. The first reality is you can repent unless you realize you deserve the tower fall on you. Second reality, the two realities must meet. Second reality is there is an underlying assumption by all of us, by all humankind, that God owes us all a good life. Now, this is assumption. We are assuming in our life that God owes us all a good life. Now, with that assumption, and if you don't believe that you deserve power to fall on you, then you have a radical self-centeredness in your life. And what do you mean by radical self-centeredness is this. I like this poem. You know, when you go into any places these days, anywhere you go, people who do not profess that Jesus is your Lord, you go anywhere, advices are given to people uh, in the marketplace, in the schools, in the, in the universities, in, even, in, in, even in the simplest places of, of, uh, of places that you know. It could be even in the market. It could be even in, in the train station. It could be in anywhere. When people are going through difficulties, the one thing they will say is, you have to take hold of your challenges. You have to handle it yourself. You are the master. You are the one that has entire control. But this is, this is today. Today, we hear people talk like this, but this has been talked many centuries ago. And I just want to share with you a famous poem. You probably heard of this poem. This poem, which is known as Invictus, meaning conquering, by William Ernest Henley. This poem says, it matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishments to the scroll. I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. This is what's happening. This is the millennium generation who believes that they are the master of their faith, who believes that they are the captain of their soul. But this leads us to radical self-centeredness. And that's the reason why Jesus is saying, firstly, we cannot assume that the tower will not fall on us. We deserve the tower to fall on us. We cannot assume that God owes us all a good life. And when you do not assume these two things, you know we need repentance. We need to go to, go to God, asking God for mercy. So friends, it's not only that we all need repentance. Repentance is turning from sin by turning to God. 
You just cannot turn away from sin, but you must turn to someone, and that someone is God Himself. And so the word repentance, if you go in to the Bible dictionary, you will find that the word repentance is a Greek word called metanoa. Meta is going beyond. Noah is something to do with a mind. And so you have metaphysics, you have paranoia. So the noia means is the mind. It's the meta means going beyond. But what happens is in order to go beyond and in order to, to repent, you need to turn away, turn from sin and turn to God. And you do that, it's a mind and a heart that works together to do that change. So are you happy? Repent. Are you sad? Repent. Because when you are happy, when you repent, you are depending on God's grace and you're not stealing away His glory for you and for your family. But are you sad? Life difficulties, challenges has come. Repent. And so repent continually. First question, why do we need to re repent? Because we need God. We need Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Second question, the nature of repentance. Not only we need to repent, but what is the nature of repentance? According to the Bible in verse, Luke chapter 13, verse 6 and 7. And so Jesus, as usual, he is the master storyteller. He likes to tell stories. And by telling a parable, so he brings out the principles. And so, and he told this parable in Luke chapter 13, verse 6 to 7. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? So Jesus tells a parable to reinforce his point, and make it clear. Remember why Jesus used parable, to help people understand what he was saying. So I believe this parable was actually directed to the Jewish people because Jesus was sent to minister primarily to the Jewish people. However, I also feel that this parable applies to ourselves. It is an example of how God deals with us and lead us to repentance. So first, the nature of repentance. God owns us. You see, the parable tells us that we see the owner has a fig tree. He owns it and he has cared for it, for it in his vineyard. He regularly goes to inspect it, expecting to see some fruit. So friends, firstly, God owns us. He is the owner of the vineyard. The owner has been checking this tree himself for three years. That's what the parable says. In all this time, the fig tree has not shown any fruit at all. That is bad enough, but even worse, the fig tree is taking up space and the nutrients in the soil that could have been useful for other plants. Eventually, the owner's patience with the fig tree comes to an end. It must be cut down. So what is the interpretation and application that we can see? God owns us. We must remember that Jesus is telling this parable in the context of the need for repentance. It is urgent that we repent as soon as possible. The tree is us. The fruit is the love for God and repentance, while the caretaker is Jesus. So friends, in this parable, not difficult to find out. The tree is us. The fruit is the love for God and repentance, and, the repent and while the caretaker is Jesus. He plants us in his vineyard. The Bible says in Acts chapter 17 to 20 and 26, 17, 26, that God determines the time and places for man to live so that we would seek him and find him. So friends, because you are in Malaysia, 
because you are at this time staying here god has put you here god has made you born in this place and the, and to be alive in this season in this time in this season and god has given us this opportunity so the nature for repentance god owns us god is patient with us why because he allows us to go into repentance but friends do not assume this patient will be continuing because you can see the words here yeah. god the, the owner of the vineyard says cut it down why should he use up the space why is there no fruit at all and so god when god put us here and god given us created us for a purpose he wants to have a relationship with us like the owner of the fig tree god is patient with us and give us time and repeated opportunities to know him he gives us many years to produce fruit sometimes not just 3 years my friends human kind faces judgment if we do not repent and turn to god we will face judgment for which we cannot blame god because god's desire is not for anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance however friends i want to say this in the light of all that is happening do not let god's patience run on us i like the scene in in you know at the cross when the two thieves were nailed together with jesus and one of them said jesus would you remember me at that very point jesus said today you will be be in paradise friends do not put away repentance because human kind faces judgment if we don't repent and turn to god we will face judgment in which we cannot blame god and so there is a need for repentance what's the nature of repentance and finally the second the last question is what's the nurture of repentance how does this repentance be nurtured now i like this parable because thank god that the parable didn't just stop there it has verses 8 to 9 yeah so verses 8 to 9 says sir the man replied leave it alone for one more year and i would dig around it and fertilize it if it bears fruit next year fine if not then cut it down the man who works in the vineyard asked for one more chance for the fig tree he wants to try especially hard to help the fig tree produce some fruit he intends to break up and the hard ground around the tree and mix it with some manure to fertilize it if the fig tree grow finally produces some fruit the next year then all is good it will not be cut down however if it still does not produce fruit there is nothing more can be done has to be cut down so friends i just want to say one a few things here firstly the nurture of repentance that's commitment as i said just now the caretaker the wine dresser is jesus jesus is committed to save us from what we deserve i like what the old methodist bible commentator adam clark says about jesus in this case he says quote he is constantly employed in doing everything that has a tendency to promote their salvation in other words jesus is always trying is always employing everything he can in doing everything that he has to do to make sure that salvation comes to our heart our house salvation come to us and our loved ones jesus is committed to his cause he is interceding for us 
He intercedes on our behalf. He is still interceding. God is always thinking of us and longing for our return to Him. So friends, as Jesus is committed to His cause, He went to the cross to die for us. He is now still committed to see us repent. He is interceding for each and every one of us. Not only that, He brings conviction. He sends His Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin and to gently help us back and to gently help us back from sinning. He wants us to come back to Him. He is leading us to return to Him. So like the man who tends the vineyard, the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit works in us to break us up the hard ground of our hearts and to nourish us spiritually. He does everything He can to bring us to repentance. So friends, our Lord is committed. Our Lord is interceding. Our Lord is bringing conviction to every one of us. There's a cause. A cause. God is eager to bring us back, although there's a cost to it. What it means by cause? Let me just say something here. You see the story of the, para, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. I'm sure you know the story very well. Okay, I know, it's, I know you know the story by heart. I know everything uh, you know about the story. It's already so familiar to us. But I just want to link this something about repentance. The repentance of the younger brother, right? We all know that the younger brother went astray, while asked the father for his inheritance, and he go away and squander the inheritance. And then suddenly when he was in, uh, you know, as a pig saw sort of worker in a pig stall, he was, he was suddenly something, he had, a realization came into him. And he says, now, if I go back to my father and ask for forgiveness, I can just be, get myself hired as a hireling and work for him. And not as a son, but as a hired hireling. And so he made the journey back. So I went to, as he went to see the father and repented, you see, the repentance of the younger brother, what did he did? When he repented, he told his father, father, I have sinned against you. Just take me as your hired hand. And the father kissed him. And the father said, No, you are my son. You are not a hired servant. You are my son. And he told the servant, Bring the robe. Bring the ring. Cut the fatted calf. We have a celebration. Today my son was once lost, but he's found. But I want to make sure that you understand. Repentance is not self-flagellation okay it is not what i what jaya packer calls attrition attrition is a theological word it means that you are sorrow for sin just you flagellate yourself it's self-inflicted sorrow sorrow and hitting yourself for it it is not repentance is not that on the other hand it is a contrition it is out of a contrite heart you will repent. It is not self flagellation It is where Jesus say, bring the rope and bring the ring. So when we repent on one hand, it is not self flagellation It is not inflicting pain. But on the other hand, when we repent, we must not take lightly of what Jesus has paid for us, the price to redeem us. So it is a change of mind, but it is also a change of heart coming to the Lord, knowing that we need repentance. And what's repentance all about? And finally, the nature of the nurture of repentance. Because it is only when we understand the price that Jesus has paid for us, we know that it is out of that price we will be able to repent. So friends, finally, I want to conclude. Repent or perish is a title, but we all have hope. The conclusion of this is I'd like to conclude with this statement by John Newton. And you know who John Newton is? The slave trader who came to know the Lord. He says this word, 
The gospel makes the worst times bearable and the best times livable. What does that mean? The God who created us loves us so much that he sent his son to die to take on our sins and our shame. His death brought us life. So when we believe that even in our darkest days, we can still have hope. Even our darkest struggles can have life. And not only that, but when life is going well, friends, life will go well for some of us. In fact, for all of us, I pray that life will go well with us. But when we are experiencing happy circumstances, don't you ever dare say, God is about time that you must bless me. Don't you ever dare say that. The gospel reminds us that these good things aren't the ultimate thing. It is not the ultimate thing. Even the best things in life will let you us down someday. But we must remember the best is yet to come. And so we must be able to leave behind the best times because the best time is yet to come. That is when you meet your maker. All these, good, the bad, it should point us to one thing, the ultimate hope of all, is the ultimate joy in Jesus Christ. Friends, when we repent, when bad times come, when we ask for God for mercy, we're looking to Jesus. When we are going through great times, great harvests, happy times, we also look to Jesus and give him all the glory because the best is yet to come. So friends, just remember that. And I want to say that while this is a warning, while this parable today warns us you repent or perish, this is a warning here. God comes to you bringing good things and bad things for you to repent. But you must never, ever say, I will repent next year. Don't you ever say, I won't repent today. But God, I will repent next year. Jesus, I will repent the following year. You know why you would finally harden your heart. Because if you don't repent today, you would finally harden your heart. And the next year will never come. If the Lord pricks your heart today, whatever you have done, whatever state of your mind you are in, or condition of your heart you are in, today is the day. Now is the time. No matter how black, how bad, how terrible your past is, no matter how much pain that you you have gone through, how terrible it can be, make repentance your ultimate aim. Friends, as I was praying for you the past one week, I always try to ask what God is saying in this time for, for all of you in Subang Methodist Church. And I was asking God, God, is there anything you want me to say? And so I, I have this, this word that came to my mind. Uh, uh, came to my mind because I believe God has put this in, in, in the heart. And he says here, it's one word saying safety net. Now, I, I tried to Google and find this picture. I'm trying to find yes and and this is a picture of a safety net i don't know how many of you know what's a safety net but a safety net is a net that uh, you know uh, it's in the construction site if you are a construction man you see uh, if you look at a building that is half finished you look at a net there's a netting uh, it's safe it is a safety net for basically making sure some debris doesn't fall on the road but 
I want to say that this safety net is also something like, you know, if you see somebody um, in a circus, uh, you know, uh, you will see a lot of safety net. A safety net is to protect people from falling down. But I want to say that uh, this is what the Lord says. You are called to be a safety net. The call to each and every one of you there. Binding together with a bond of love. Holding one another. Providing a safety net for the people around you. For the people who are suffering. The people who are in need for the gospel to be preached. You are called to be a safety net so that people can depend on you. They can trust you. They can understand that there is a God that is on their side to save because you become a safety net for the people who long, who are not wanted in this world, who are outcast of this world, but you provide a safety net. And so, friends, I want to end with this statement that from Westman, uh, Westminster Confession of Faith. He says, and there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation. So there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. We have a hope. A people of God have a hope even as we celebrate today, the first Sunday in Advent, we are a people of hope. Emmanuel, God is with us. And I want to bring this story of hope, although it started with bloomish in the day of last year in Easter day, where more than 290 people died, 500 people injured. But I want to tell you this, it brings hope. It is hope at the end of the day for people to continue to trust God. And out of that repentance, there comes hope. Out of repentance, good or bad, repent. Because in repentance, we have hope. Hope for tomorrow. Let us pray. Lord, I just want to commit my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, for all of us, we are not together physically in one place. But Lord, we are together in the presence of yours. I pray for all our friends, Lord, in their homes, wherever they are, Lord, make repentance as their daily goal. Because in repentance, good things or bad things, we repent. We repentance, Lord, we say that we have hope in you. In repentance, Lord, we become safety net for others. So I release these words, safety net into the life of my brothers and sisters. May you continue to watch over them as they become the safety net for the people around them. That the gospel of Jesus Christ will go far and wide and that more shall be added into your kingdom through repentance. And thank you, Lord. All of our lives are repentance. And we trust you, Jesus, as our Lord, our author and perfecter of our faith. In you, we have hope. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone say, Amen.